Next up, we're going to jump straight into um, the next session, which is going to be a fireside chat with Josh Williams, who's the CEO and co-founder of Forte, which is a new blockchain um, gaming platform that aims to help align developers and players in how they earn economically. Um, and interviewing Jeff is going to be, or Josh, is going to be Jeff Tunnel, who is the founder of Monster Ideas and a number of other companies that he founded earlier where he designed, directed, produced um, hundreds of games. So Jeff and Josh, come on up. All right, so in my long career as a game and game technology creator, I've seen lots of new platforms and new technologies come along that have like totally changed the way we had to make games. Um, probably the biggest one of those, well, obviously the biggest one was the advent of the internet. And um, it took our industry, you know, 10 years to, to figure it out. And I think we're kind of still figuring it out, but that, that was when it really started to happen. And one of the games that I created is called Tribes. And it was a first person team based shooter, kind of one of the first ones that really incorporated a lot of what was going on in the internet. And it was kind of controversial for us inside the company at the time because it was a big project when we got to the end and we didn't have time to put a single player into it. And so we launched it as multiplayer only. And which seemed, it was really, uh, that was really risky at the time, but it ended up that it did work. Now it just seems really obvious that everybody releases a lot of multiplayer only games and they're all internet connected. And I think in the future, it's gonna be kind of similar for blockchain. It's going to really cause some big disruption in games. And I think Josh is gonna tell us some of what blockchain will be able to unleash for us in games. Yeah, <clears throat> um, I think exactly as you said, Jeff, um, it's a good analogy. Um, blockchain will um, disrupt and change gaming in, in, I think, a very similar way to the internet. It might, it might be, cause even, even bigger changes uh, because the internet helped uh, interconnect players um, and Tribes was really an example of a, a, a great innovative game designer, you, know, you um, who embraced the bleeding edge technology early on to create a game that was really revolutionary. And, and I played Tribes a lot uh, when I was a kid. Um, blockchain will be similar and maybe bigger because um, it's not just interconnecting people, but changing potentially the business model of games and creating uh, the potential for a lot uh, better game economies that align developers and players and, and work much better for both of them. And it can really do that in, in four ways. Um, so the first way is by leveraging blockchain technology, games can allow players to really own uh, the assets uh, in their games. Um, today, players in games spend about $150 billion a year purchasing games and digital goods in games. And, and the majority of that revenue actually is, is purchasing goods inside of games. But players don't own any of them. Um, so that's the first one. Uh, and when you introduce ownership, it could really change the way that the games are, are made and, and played and how the economies work. Um, the second one is blockchains enable you to have the provenance of every item uh, and every asset in the game. So that means you, know, you can know the history uh, of every item in a game. Um, the third is um, games can create really rich marketplaces. Uh, or blockchain can create really rich marketplaces inside of games. So when players own these assets and you can determine whether or not an asset is, is real, you know its history and provenance, um, you can create rich marketplaces uh, around those items. And the fourth is because blockchains um, can incorporate smart contracts, code that executes autonomously uh, through the blockchain. Um, you can create these rich incentive systems that reward players and participants in the game in, in different ways. Yeah, so that, that's a really quick overview. We're going to delve into it a little bit more. Uh, let's talk about the ownership a little bit. Sure. A little bit more, a little deeper. Yeah, so you know, if you think about it, the ability for players to really own things inside of games, the virtual goods and virtual currencies inside of games, it, it transforms um, the, player, the, the purchases that players are making from pure expenditures, where again, players are taking over $100 billion a year out of their wallets to, to purchase these goods. It transforms them from expenditures to assets that the players own. And so players could choose to, to um, you know, resell assets uh, if, they, if they own them. They could choose to incorporate the assets into another asset that might be in, in the game. And the thing about these assets being stored on blockchains is no one can take the asset away from the player. 
uh, the player truly owns it. And they don't have to trust a third party, including the game developer themselves, uh, that they truly own, truly own the asset. Yeah, and I think that's probably what most people think about when they think about crypto technologies or blockchain technologies and games. But it really is important. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll just do like a pretty obvious example here, but you know, imagine you've played WoW for a year and you, you take your rogue up to level 70 um, and you're tired of playing it and you want to become a warrior. Um, if, if that was a blockchain-enabled game, then you could take that character and either give it to your friends so they can come back and play, play the game with you, or, or you, can, you can sell it to somebody and maybe get back a little bit of the, of the, of the money that you've paid in and in your subscription for the last year. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, when you play a game and you're really into it, you, you get to uh, really care about the assets you have in the, in the game, you care about your characters, uh, you sometimes put a lot of money into those things. And so um, to see real value and, and to truly own those things and to be able to do what you want with them as a, as a player would be, you know, great as a player and transformative for, for games as a whole. And, you know, touching on the second point, which is really the provenance of, of the items, of the assets in a game that blockchains enable, um, what that lets you do is, is, is know that when it, someone is claiming that they have an asset and they have a, the right to an asset, um, you can verify that that is true. Um, you don't have to trust anyone to do that. So you can imagine in, a real, in the real world, you know, outside of games, if someone was trying to sell you a, a basketball jersey and they said, hey, this is the jersey that Steph Curry wore at the, in the final game of the 2015 NBA championships when they won, and so it's going to cost $1,000, you know, you, you would just have to trust them that that's true or, you know, maybe find a third party to trust that has somehow certified that that's the real deal. What's cool about games and blockchain is because the assets are digital, if they're stored on a blockchain, you, you don't have to trust anyone. When someone says that, hey, this item, maybe it's a, it's a sword, this is the sword that was used by the first player to ever take down you know, the biggest, baddest boss in the game, and you, you could know that it's you know, that collectible, unique item, and, and maybe that it's got some you know, special characteristics unlocked because it is that unique, that unique item. And so blockchain enables that as well. Yeah, and that's actually, I mean, it might sound kind of trivial at first, but, but it, it does kind of, it, it can take an asset and make it more unique, more collectible. Uh, and that's, again, kind of an obvious thing, but when you start really thinking deeply about this, it, it, it makes it, it's pretty important. And then you can also kind of start seeing how people could take, do things like, maybe there's an enterprising person that goes out and, and collects this open information from tons and tons of games and puts it all on one website and maybe it's kind of like an appraisal website so that you can go and you can check the value of your, you know, plus 18 sword in the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that leads to the third point, which is you can create these rich marketplaces in games, right? So one player is on the assets and they're therefore, they know they own it and so they therefore ascribe value to them and they can verify without trusting anyone that the history of the assets and, and its uh, authenticity um, you can start to price items, you can start to trade items together and create these rich marketplaces. Uh, and the, rich, the richness of the marketplaces can be, you know, not only enabling trading between players and the transfer of assets and value between players, but also um, pretty complex economic designs around how that value gets split up. And this is where developers can start to benefit as well. So that um, they might take a share of, of transactions. Uh, if you know, you had these assets that were owned by, you know, that, that example we, we used of a sword that was, you know, used to take down the biggest boss in the game for the first time. The player that, that killed that boss with that sword could always take a share, if, if, the, if the smart contracts were structured this way, of every transaction, every trade of that sword subsequently. Um, so you can open up all these new designs that were never possible prior to blockchain or, or weren't possible without solely trusting the game developer um, themselves. Yeah, and you could also use that, that kind of thing for incentives to um, move your players around to, to help them do things that you want them to do and also that they've kind of wanted to do anyway in the game. That's right. Yeah, and, that, and that's the fourth one. It's designing incentive structures in the game. So when you have a game that has a, a, an economy based on real asset values that, that players own, uh, you can have currencies, you can have assets in that game. You could start to grant, you know, as a developer, you can write smart contracts that essentially incentivize or reward players through grants of currencies and, and assets and items when they do things that are helpful for the game and for other players. So you could reward players for, you know, maybe, maybe 
senior players who have experienced a lot of the game, you could give them you know, currency. You could drop into their account currency for um, helping new players you know, get through a dungeon for the very first time. And so you can create these really rich incentive mechanisms in, in a game in, in ways that, again, just weren't possible previously if you start to incorporate blockchain technology. And there's a lot of cool stuff. We're working with developers to do like that. Um, we're working with a, a battle royale game. Battle royale games are like, are like Fortnite. It kind of incorporates a bunch of the things we just talked about. Um, the skins, there are skins in the game right now. That, so those are cosmetics that you can equip on your character to make them look differently. It doesn't affect the, the gameplay in, the, in this case, um, but, but it personalizes the character for you. Um, this developer that we're working with is, is tokenizing the skins in the game. So they're putting the skins on the blockchain, they're letting players truly own them, and they're making the skins tradable within the game. Um, and that creates a new revenue stream for the developer, and it gives the players much more um, agency, much more uh, ownership in the game, and, and you know, it makes the game more fun for the players. Um, because now they can benefit from the game, not only from it being fun, but by doing a good job unlocking new skins and, and potentially earning an, an income from them. Yeah, so I actually have some personal experience that where this would have helped me out tons on one of the games that we created. Uh, we created a game for um, Disney and Playdom called Social City. It was, a, it was a social city building game that was on the Facebook platform back, back when that was going really big. And uh, we ended up... It was a hit. It had 2 million daily active users. Uh, my mom played it, my sister, my wife. First time in my career that, that I had that happen. But, and so that was an interesting aside. But, but while, while the game was very successful and was making a ton of money, we were really worried about the business model because it was really just selling digital goods. You know, put a new building in, put a new road in, put a new sidewalk in. And you could see where we were going to hit a wall in that. So we were in the back room, just like squirrels running as fast as we could go, trying to figure out a way to make an economy. But back then we just did not have the tools. It would be so wonderful to have these blockchain tools. So I'd like maybe talk a little bit about how you build these community economies for, for these games. Yeah. So, you know, social city was, it was a big hit. It was one of the earliest and most successful free to play games in the West. Um, and it kind of Jeff, as you were talking about it, it hit the same problem that pretty much every free to play game today uh, runs into uh, as it, as it grows and free to play games dominate the, the games industry today. They, they kind of took the industry from, you know, 10 to $40 billion uh, 20 years ago to, you know, $150 billion plus dollars a year today. Um, because what they do is, you know, they allowed players to play a game for free for the first time. And that aligned, that aligned developers and players a little more than they had been in the past. Um, it, prior to free-to-play games, players had to purchase a game up front without really getting a chance to see it. And so you couldn't get these, it was really hard to get these massive audiences uh, in games and, and players, you were asking them to spend 50 or $60 in a game without uh, even knowing what it was really like to, to play it. The free to play games, you get a little closer to the player, a little bit more aligned with the player in that, okay, you guys, you let the player come in for, for free, uh, which is great, that's a benefit for the player, but then you have to have to figure out how to monetize it because you didn't monetize it up front. And you run into this problem that Social City and every other major free-to-play game runs into, which is you constantly have to pump out new content um, as a developer. Um, you have to sell players more and more of these goods uh, inside of a game because it's your only way to, to make revenue. And the really pernicious thing that happens in, in this model, even though it's maybe friendlier in some ways to players than pure upfront purchases, is a small percentage of the audience ends up purchasing anything at all. And you know, our, our team and, and, and myself, um, we've seen some of the, the most successful um, free-to-play games in, in the world, and almost across the board, a very small percentage of the audience, 5% or less typically, makes any purchase whatsoever. And very frequently, less than 1% of players in, these, in the top free-to-play games account for 80% or more of the revenue. So what that means is you have a very small percentage of your audience that you end up catering to. And those individual players often spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or, or, or millions of dollars a year, even though it sounds crazy, uh, in these games. Uh, and so you have to produce content that caters to them without, somehow without alienating 
you know, the rest of the players that, that don't do it. And it's an incredible, that they don't pay anything. And that's an incredibly challenging design problem. It's incredibly frustrating for players to feel like, you know, the people that spend the most might be able to get the coolest stuff in the game or be more powerful uh, in the game. And so there's still misalignment even in the free to play model. Uh, what blockchain technology and, the, and those four um, new interaction models, economic models, um, new capabilities that blockchain enables for games can, can really do is, align players and developers, where as a developer, you can start to pull um, a marketplace, uh, the ownership that players have uh, of the items in your game, you can start to pull a marketplace around those into the game and create win-wins with players, where players now own value, they can transact value, they can even earn an income from the game, and you as a developer can create a bigger economy without just having to create new content all the time. If you allow players to trade, just as a simple example, um, you can earn a revenue stream from those trades as they occur uh, over time. So yeah, I mean, it might, might be kind of obvious, but one of the first things you would think about doing there, if, if we talk about win-win or community economies, would be um, a lot of the really big games nowadays, they have the, uh, the gray market that's out there, the, you know, for uh, uh, buying World of Warcraft gold or, um, you know, different skins for different games or, or even trading accounts around will get you banned from the game nowadays but now you could you could bring that economy into the game and get rid of a lot of the fraud and things like that that's happening out in, that's, in the in the real world that's exactly right and you know players want to be able to do this as we as we discussed earlier you know when you invest a lot of time or money into um, your characters or assets or items in a game um, you want to be able to trade them sometimes. And, and sometimes, you know, a game might be designed to require you to spend a lot of time in order to get the cool stuff that you want. And you would love as a player to be able to just go buy that thing sometimes. Um, and so players do this. Uh, there's massive kind of side economy outside of that $150 billion a year where players are just trading with each other outside of the games. Um, but it's problematic because the developers don't earn any revenue from those transactions. Uh, and players are always subject to the risk of counterparty fraud, um, as Jeff said. So, you know, if you're trying to buy a new item from a game, uh, from a, another player in a game, and it's not sanctioned by the game itself, you got to go to some third-party website, enter your credit card information, and risk, you know, someone stealing, you know, your 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 identity or, or your credit card information, um, and and maybe not even get the item that you were trying to purchase in the game despite taking that risk. Uh, when you leverage the blockchain um, to enable these, marketplace, uh, these marketplaces and economies inside of a game, you can do that in a secure, trustless fashion uh, by leveraging the security of the blockchain uh, itself. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's really just hard to express how powerful that, that is from, the, from a, you know, a producer or a designer of a game to have these, these tools. It's, it's incredibly powerful. I would like to, you know, I'm 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 a convert now, so you know I'm barely touching the ground. But but when I first, when Josh first started talking to me about these blockchain, uh, incorporating blockchain into the games, I when I started doing my own research and and uh, probably you may, many of you, if you if you went out and looked at there, you'd, you kind of feel like it's kind of scammy out there. Uh, everything feels a little bit like a pyramid scheme. And so I was like, eh, I don't know about that. But then, you know, the, the more you talk about it, when you get into it, uh, there's just some, there, in addition to those, the four types of things that blockchain can unlock, it, it, that adds up to something way, way bigger. And I'd like Josh to explain that because this is, this is the conversion moment right here. <laughs> I think, yeah, when we talk with developers about these systems they can um, incorporate in their games, um, what, what, really starts to get compelling about it is, you know, when you think about it, games today, is, as Jeff said, in examples like Social, Social City or the top, you know, most successful games today, developers are really just acting as merchants where they're selling goods to, to players and, and, and that's it. When you start to really get deep on what blockchain technology could enable for games, you realize there's many more ways for developers to um, benefit from the games they create and to create games that are better for players as well. Uh, and so it kind of shifts you from being just a merchant uh, to managing, you can think about it like, you know, creating in your virtual world that you, that you create in your game, you're, you're also creating an economy that's more real. So the operates just like the real world, where we all in the real world, you know, we, we own assets, we earn income, we conduct commerce and, and trade with each other. And 
blockchain can enable that inside of uh, inside the virtual worlds of, of games as well. So um, developers kind of shift from being just a merchant selling goods to it's almost like you're managing a little country and you're trying to create the biggest economy that you can for the citizens inside of your country. Uh, and that unlocks new ways to earn revenue for the developer as well. So, you know, there's, there's again, four, four things you can do um, with that. Um, so you can still continue to sell goods inside of the game, just like you do now, and those goods don't have to be on the blockchain. You can still sell goods that players don't own. So you don't lose anything by, you know, incorporating blockchain into your, into your game. Um, but you can also design around player ownership and the marketplaces we've talked about. And so you can start to set up the equivalent of a, a fiscal policy, essentially, in the parlance of macroeconomics and, and um, governments. You, know, you can think about what sorts of taxes and fees you want to operate in your economy. So players own assets, and you can set up the rules for you know, how people can trade with each other. And you can also set up what, what the fees are and what the taxes might be as players start to trade with each other. Maybe you as a developer take 5% or 10% or 30% of every transaction. And... It's really cool to think about how developers and players get aligned here because a, a simple-minded developer might think, well, I'll just make the fee as high as I can. I'll charge 70% on, on every trade. And you could do that, but your game probably would be less successful than another game that charges lower fees and is more beneficial to, to players and encourages more, more trading. So what you really want to do is just you design your economy, this kind of second this second portion of it with the fiscal policy to encourage the creation of the largest possible economy, which means players are benefiting more too because they're owners in the economy as well. So it really lines up players and developers. Um, the third way that developers can uh, benefit, the third revenue stream can be, so, so again, you have a sale, sale of goods, you have taxes and fees like a fiscal policy. The third way is you have assets in these games and players own them and developers can own them too. So you could have a reserve of assets and you know, the bigger you make your game, the, the better job you do in designing the game and making it fun and designing the economy, the more valuable the assets in, in your economy could be for both you and for the players. And so you as a developer could sell off those assets. They're not just virtual goods, they're the assets that are on the blockchain. And so that's a third way that developers can benefit in a way they really couldn't prior to the introduction of, of blockchain. Yeah, and it's actually really amazing if you, if you start calculating this out and think of maybe a total addressable market here. Uh, I'm going to sure, yeah, get this great. Yeah, the, the, I think, you know, well, and before we get to, you know, thinking about what the total macro picture could look like, the, the last way developers can make a, a revenue stream here is, is um, you can set a, a monetary policy too, just like you would uh, in, in a country. So you can have whatever macroeconomic design you, you think will work best or you kind of experiment and learn will, will work best inside of, your, inside of your game. Um, so you can set rates of inflation. And you can, as we discussed at the beginning, you could reward players for different types of behaviors. And that might deflate or that might in, inflate, you know, the, the, the economy by producing more currency when you're granting players, you know, maybe free gold or, or, or free coins for performing certain actions. Maybe it's logging in every day. Maybe it's helping other players. Um, but you, if even despite that inflation, if it helps players contribute to the game or, or um, perform actions that help the economy overall, it could grow the total size of the economy. And you as a developer can also participate in those rewards. You, you write it in a smart contract so that you can't change the rules willy-nilly. But let's say you reward, you allow players to create content in your game. Uh, and then you reward them through these inflationary kind of monetary mechanisms for the content that gets used the most by other players, right? So it could might be, you know, a new dungeon that someone creates or a new script of dialogue that an NPC, a non-player character in the game says. Um, and you might give more rewards to the most popular pieces of content for players. You could do the same thing for yourself as a developer. You're a great content creator. Maybe the new content you create also participates in those rewards. And if it's popular with players, that's worth it because it grew the total size of the economy. So if you step back and put all these pieces together, again, you're kind of creating a more market economy inside of games. Instead of a command and control economy or just a pure merchant economy, which is the case in games today. And, you know, market economies are how the world works today. And, you know, they're, the world's economy is much bigger today than it was in the past. And the same thing will happen in games. And a, a simple way to understand that might be, you know, there are games like Fortnite today that have hundreds of millions of players that play them every single month. 
Uh, and those games are wildly successful. It's the most successful games that have ever been created or being created today. But they do, you know, a couple billion dollars a year in revenue at, at their peak today, which, which is massive. But if you think about it, you know, if you had a game that incorporated blockchain technology to create a real market economy for players inside of the game, and you got just a million players that were earning just a minimum livable wage, like say $30,000 a year inside of the game because you created this rich economy, then that game, a million players making $30,000 a year from the game which would have a $30 billion a year economy, which would be by far the biggest game that's ever created with only, only a million players that are able to, to achieve that. And that, you know, on its own would be larger than the entire global music industry. Uh, and it's not difficult to imagine a game that, that, that could do that by incorporating these, these mechanisms. Hey, um, yeah, so I had, I had a couple of quick questions. So I wasn't, I guess I'm still curious about what's the material difference between having an SDK for implementing a lot of these economic type of mm -hmm. interactions for mm -hmm. games versus having it be blockchain related. Sure. And if the issue is trusting the developer, I'm actually also curious because I'm, I'm just not that sure about how big the trust issue between a game player and game developer actually is and like, are there? Yeah, yeah, so everybody could hear the question. Um, so the reason to put this on blockchain versus just having an SDK or a central database that you know op tried to operate the economy is is, is twofold. Uh, one, it's that it's really hard to secure these things as an individual developer, and by leveraging the public blockchains that exist, you're inheriting the hundreds of literal hundreds of billions of dollars of security and stored value that exists on these blockchains today. Instead of having to try to figure out how to secure your database from hackers or exploits, you know, from, from gamers. So that's the first part, and, it, and it's the simpler part, but, but it's still important. The big thing is really the size of the economy you can create. So your players might, might, might trust you as a developer, um, especially your ardent fans who have maybe been loyal to you for years, but, you know, a new player who comes into the game and doesn't know who you are as a developer and doesn't have a lot of, you know, investment and engagement in, in your game isn't going to trust you as a developer as much as they will trust, you know, the broader marketplace that is represented by these blockchains and the assets that they, that they live there. If they know, hey, these assets live on a blockchain and the developer actually can't control it even if they wanted to, you're going to have more trust um, than you would. And, and the important point there is not just trust, it's that it creates a larger economy. The reason we're able to conduct commerce today is because, you know, we have an idea of safety and soundness in, in an economy. We, we think, even though we've seen it fail many times, you know, and there's been different financial crises, people believe in the dollar enough to conduct, you know, transactions. And so basically the more you can, and, and the promise of blockchain is that it can be totally trustless and unlock all these new economic activities where people are more sovereign and can choose who to trust. Um, and so that just unlocks more economic activity. And it's the same thing uh, in, in games where uh, if you can maximize trust, you maximize the size of the economy. And so you want to do everything you can to maximize basically the, de the degree that um, players can trust the economy itself as opposed to any one actor, including the developer. Uh, two uh, big properties of blockchain are interoperability and transparency. Isn't it the case that uh, that actually undermine business models of, of game developers because actually any other team can instantly like take over the user base quite quite easily because it's all on the blockchain. They can simply uh, deploy some other solution and says. Like, like do the airdrop or something like that. So, so like, uh, it starts to be a very competitive market. Isn't it actually a threat for blockchain games? So it's a good question, but there's a bit of a misconception there, right? So um, if you think about it, just because it, so totally, the smart contracts are open, they're transparent, uh, they're interoperable, and that's a beneficial thing in that, again, you know as a player that you, know, you can transfer value from one game to another. 
right? Um, but that's, it doesn't mean that you can just copy a game's smart contracts or the way it's designed its economy and somehow shift all of its players over because if you're the developer of a, of a game and you've published these smart contracts and you've set up the rules for your, for your economy and you've created you know, a game that attracts a lot of players, those players then store value in that economy. So you can't just you know, copy the code, you can't just design a game that's interoperable and does some airdrops and gives some gifts to players. You have to actually convert those players to move to your game, first of all, and spend their time and energy there and start spending dollars there, but also transfer the value that, that they have stored in the assets in your game to your network, as opposed to uh, just being able to use the items. And uh, some other studio want to uh, offer some other game attractive. They will have very hard time to move these users uh, because user will need to leave everything because of Warcraft by moving. If you have uh, interoperable blockchain where user own his assets, then the user can make that choice. It's empowered to make that choice and that. Actually, puts uh, the game developer in a very uncomfortable position. Yeah, what, yeah so, what, so uh, since there wasn't a microphone, so everybody can hear the question, it's, hey, if these assets really live on the blockchain and users can do what they like with them, couldn't they take the asset from, from one game to another or transfer the value of the asset from one game to another? And in a traditional game like World of Warcraft, you can't do that. Um, so that kind of creates a protective, a, a walled garden around the game itself. And so, and so that's true, but the flip side of it is you create, like, you also limit how much value players ascribe to the game itself and how big that economy can be. So if people are willing to spend, you know, $10 on an item in, in World of Warcraft and know that it's just an expense, they don't own the item and they can't do what they want with it, you know, well, that's great. They're willing to spend $10. But if they knew that they can own it and they can transfer it to another game, if the developer, you know, displeases them or if there's another game that's even better and can interoperate with the same assets, they might pay a lot more it, just to know that they could resell the good. So you create a bigger game economy this way. And it's this, what, you, what you're describing is the same thing as, you know, back in the day, there used to be a feudal economy system where there was a lord of the land who controlled everything and everybody else was just a serf. And yeah, it was great for the lord of the land at the time because they were the boss and they got to set all the rules and the serfs didn't really own anything. But the economies got a lot bigger and people did a lot better when you open things up and you had a market economy where everybody owns things and everybody has to compete, including developers. And the best developers in this new world where you Im incorporate blockchain games will, will embrace this and create games that are really designed to empower players and grow the biggest economy possible. And then as a player, you won't just simply you know, take your asset from one game to another. You're going to go to the game that has the richest economy and the most players and the, and the, and the best gameplay and you know, has your, your friends there. So it is a mindset shift and, and there is a a, a risk in the sense that, boy, I'm, I'm a developer, I'm used to just controlling the whole, the whole world. But the downside of that is you have a much, much smaller potential economy than if you open it up and create a real market economy. But also from, a, from just a pure game design standpoint, taking an asset from one game, whether you own it, own it or not, uh, taking it into another game is... I, right. I think you would actually have to design that into the game. You would have to have several games that got together and talked about our designs so that you can get an asset out of one game and go take it into another game. I think the ownership is more that I have it, I can give it to my friend, I can sell it to somebody, or I can auction it off. Yeah, that's right. Definitely transferring a particular asset from game to game is, a lot of people talk about that in terms of interoperability of, of NFTs, but it doesn't really make sense for most game designs, like the particular, you know, uh, you can't move a, a sword in an RPG over to a racing game, you know, a racing car game. Or you can't, even within an, two RPGs, the mechanics work differently. You can transfer the, the value, right? If you can sell the, the sword or the, or, or the car, then you could move that value and get it back and put it into another game. But again, all, all, you're, all you're thinking there is developers basically, or players today just assume that when they make a purchase, it's a, it's an expense and there is no value they can transfer. So there's really not any downside in, and you know, players will still make pure expenses, right? Um, but there's only upside in letting them also, you know, 
uh, expand their purchases to things they, they own. Over here. Hi, um, this is awesome. I'm learning a ton because my knowledge of gaming is fairly limited, but i um, really curious to see how um, you all see the notion of identity evolving. Um, it seems like there's almost a dichotomy between kind of the blockchain community that really wants to prioritize anonymity and privacy versus players who, I mean, it seems like they're almost incentivized to be known on platforms, either for money or, I guess, platform status. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question too. Um, so there's a mix of things that happen with with games today. There's definitely a lot of pseudonymous or, or anonymous players in games. Like in some of the games I play, like I, I played, we talked about World of Warcraft and many other games. Um, I didn't want anybody in those games to know who I was in the, in the in the real world. So you know, I had player aliases, and, and players even will have many characters or many accounts within an individual game sometimes. Uh, and you can do the same thing in a pseudonymous world with, with blockchain um, as well. Wh one thing that is really interesting to think about, which blockchain could unlock, is, is the idea of sovereign identity and um, the ability for players to uh, carry an identity from game to game in a way that is uh, verifiable, trustlessly. Um, and that's something that's not really possible in, in games today. Uh, but when you when you can do that, you could you could say things like, "Hey, I was the leader of this, the most successful guild in World of Warcraft." I mean, I I Josh was not actually that person, but whoever that was could say that, and then maybe that helps them recruit players in another game in the future. So you can use blockchain in both ways. You can use it to empower pseudonymous play, which is how most games work today, or real identity potentially in the future as well, which again just unlocks more design possibilities. Hi, this is Andre. Um, so you said that uh, blockchain allows player to own the asset, but isn't it the game, the off-chain engine of the game determines the properties of the asset? So like, even if blockchain recommends this sword has a power of 100, game developers can easily override it or even stop recognizing that item. Just curious, what's your comment? On that? Yeah, it's a really good question too. So there's, there's two things. Um, one, you know, if if a developer is just willy-nilly changing the, you know, the values of uh, uh, like the, what the items do, like how, the characteristics and how they behave, um, then they're going to limit the size of their economy because players will trust them you know, less. So yes, the players own the assets, but the developer is changing the way that the assets work inside of the game too much. And so what would happen is players can start to sell those assets off because they're displeased with the developer for making too many changes. So that gives the players much more control and ownership than they would have otherwise where the developer could do that anyway. But this, and, so, and so the best developers that really embrace these market economies will put more and more of the characteristics that determine uh, how the items work and, and their provenance and the history of changes uh, uh, onto the blockchain so that they can't change it. Uh, but the second thing is, you know, there will be a world, the, the larger, if we really started to see examples of games that do, that create, you know, even smaller games that create like $30 billion a year economies in, in the example that we talked about, um, then there'll be a huge incentive to figure out how to get more and more of the compute that happens in, in a game, more and more of the processing that happens in the game to happen trustlessly. And that doesn't all need to happen on a blockchain. There's a lot of emerging technologies now for trustless general ver verifiable computation. Um, and we're working with some folks in that space that, that, you know, over time, the bigger these games get, uh, the more incentive there will be to create those, to accelerate the creation of those solutions where all the properties of the way that the items that are stored on the blockchain, you know, the, the, the value might be stored on the blockchain and the rules that govern the, the transactions or the transfer of the items might all be on the blockchain. Um, but the compute associated with how the items are used in the game might move more and more to these trustless off-chain systems. Your, your physics and your rendering in the game and you know, all the things that really just affect the gameplay experience, that doesn't really need to be on a, on a blockchain, but the way the items are used, the way their characteristics work, you know, will be increasingly trustless the more that these market economies are adopted in games. Okay, thank you guys, really appreciate it, thank you. Thanks everybody.